Today, I load my garage, I tear into brand new parts. Hopefully this works, because it's going to be kind of permanent. I use my alternator as a magnet, and I use my hand as a signal light. This would actually work as a turn signal. Now this truck has terrible wiring. Not all of it's there, and what is there has the insulation falling off it, so it's just bare wire. I think this wiring is going to have issues. It is not going to work. I'm going to rip out every single thread of wire in this truck and completely replace it. When I was thinking about how to do this video, I realized I wanted to do everything in one shot. Show you a whole thing from ignition, charging system, starting system, lights, turn signals, brake lights, everything this truck is going to need. I also realized it's not just specific to this truck. It would work on pretty much any basic vehicle. The same concepts would work on a Jeep or a buggy, a basic pickup truck, a yard vehicle, a forklift, or whatever this is. Now I'm focusing on a basic vehicle with a carburetor and a standalone ignition system. If you've got a computer, you're probably not going to be making your own wire harness anyway. But generally, computerized systems have a power wire going into the computer and that runs everything on the engine itself. A lot of this stuff will still apply as far as turn signals, brake lights, and stuff like that go. So to make sure we can see everything clearly, this table is going to be our car. First thing we need is a frame. I never realized how badly my table was warped. I'm going to assume you're needing spark plugs. Uh, if you have a diesel and you don't need spark plugs, basically it's simpler. Uh, you pretty much turn the fuel on and you're good to go. To fire the spark plugs, you need a coil. We'll need a battery. You probably aren't going to hand crank your car if you have a starter. We're going to add a starter. And here's our most basic setup. We've got the battery with two big power cables. The negative is going to the chassis. The positive is going to the starter. Now, one critical thing is a starter normally is bolted in an engine. Pretend there's one right there. But that engine needs to be grounded to the chassis. All we need to do is take power where it's coming into the main terminal on the starter and trigger the electric solenoid. You take something conductive like a screwdriver and that cranks your engine over. Now, in order to get your engine running, you're going to need this circuit. Here's a basic coil system, and you have two terminals on your coil, and hopefully they're labeled. There's a positive, and there's a negative. Now this truck has a coil that needs an external resistor. For those, you just wire a resistor in line on the power wire. So now that coil's live, but that plug isn't sparking. It doesn't spark until you remove that wire. So now, when I take the wire off, you get a spark. In theory, that will fire the engine, but it's going to be a little hard to keep time while you're driving and probably be a bit of a distraction. So what we need is a switch that runs off the engine itself. This right here is a points type distributor. Named so because it has what are called breaker points in there, which is effectively a switch. The body of the distributor is installed in our engine. Now there's a gear here that drives off the camshaft normally, and that's what actually makes it turn in exact time with the engine. They will open and then close. When they're closed, this terminal out here connects to ground. When they're open, there's no connection at all. So basically, as this thing spins around, it turns on and off for every single cylinder. Take this ground wire from our coil. Now we hook it to this terminal. And there we get our spark. You can see how much spark you get out of that. It gets to the point where it comes a blur. And this is a basic ignition system that works. They replace points with an electronic switch somewhere around the 70s. But they work under the same principle of add power to the system. Now here we have the Ford style ignition system. There we have the coil. The positive is just keyed ignition power. The green is the signal that triggers the coil. In this case, the green goes over here to this module. Uh, it's a Motorcraft DuraSpark type, and it's got a lot of wires coming out of it. Basically, you've got the green that goes to the coil. This is the one that actually triggers the coil itself. 
Then the other wires go to the switch in the distributor. So they go right there. There's a sensor in the distributor that does the same things it points to. It sends a signal to this module and tells it to fire the coil. Now this module does have a power wire to it. I was piecing this together and I was worried about what might happen with that. So I put a real low amperage fuse in it just in case something went wrong. That's the only reason I have a separate wire. They could run off the same power wire. Now on this engine, it's running an aftermarket electronic ignition, but that's real easy too. You basically have a positive and negative on the coil here. That goes to a wire going to the distributor, which has a little control box down here. So basically there's this one wire to the coil that turns it on and off. Now in GM engines, life is really easy. All you have to do is deal with two wires. One that is your connection for power to turn the ignition on, and then a signal for the tachometer if you feel like it. But that's it. These are simple to hook up. It really doesn't matter which one of these standard ignitions you have. Basically, you're going to have a power wire that powers it up. You can set up a system where you have your ignition on an alligator clip. You can even get fancy and go with a starter button switch, which basically connects those two terminals that I hit the screwdriver on. And we've got... Start it up. We got spark. It'll run with this and you can drive it around. This very truck drove that way the first time. Now, as far as the engine's concerned, this is fine. It's getting electricity where it wants and that's all it cares about. But for your own convenience, you're probably gonna wanna start adding switches because that makes life a lot easier to deal with. Now, this right here is a modern style ignition switch. And by modern, I mean something that has off, on, and start all in the same switch. This actually even has accessory position on it too, so it's real fancy. This is my current ignition switch. It has off and on. That's it. There's no accessory, there's no start, just off and on. I got the keyless one because it kind of matches my truck. This one looks pretty similar to the original. But they sell these with keys. There's all sorts of styles. There's different connectors. But basically, you're gonna have four main connectors coming out the back. Now on these universal ones, they're labeled. We have a battery connection, we have accessory connection, we have ignition connection, and the one in the center is for the starter. Now I have my key switch installed, and I'm gonna hook up my battery wire. Now we turn it to accessory, so we go backwards one. We have no power on the on or ignition position. We have power on the accessory, we have no power on start. Now we turn it to on position, we have power on both the accessory and the on position, so it connects to both these terminals. Now we turn to the start position. We have power on the starter. We also have power on the on. Do not have power on the accessory. That is important to know. So when the key switch turns to start, it turns off the accessory power. We turn it on. Uh, you can see it there. We got spark going. And we got our starter working. Now at this point, you're in pretty good shape for regular driving, but your battery's gonna run dead because you have nothing to charge it. So we need to deal with that next. Now here I have an alternator hooked up. This is a Mopar one. Uh, this is one of the more complicated systems you can use because it has an external regulator. This truck uses a generator with an external regulator that's very similar to this externally regulated alternator. I have the external regulator piggybacked on the alternator for demonstration. Normally this would be on the firewall or something, but it's just hooked up with two wires. Generally, in an alternator, you have coils of wire that are stationary, and you have coils of wire that move with the pulley. What you do is you put electricity through one of the sets of wire, and the other one doesn't have electricity to it, but the moving past each other, it actually creates voltage, which then goes through a nice big thick wire to your positive terminal. Now, you have to get electricity to the alternator before it produces juice. Now, in the case of this Mopar regulator style, power goes to the center pin, and we basically just hook up 12 volt power and that's gonna energize that coil and create a magnetic field. It's pretty strong. Watch that socket. The other thing that's important is it's drawing power the whole time. I'm running about 12.8 volts on the battery. As soon as I hook up this field, it starts dropping. So that field doesn't take a whole lot of juice, but if you leave it on, you're gonna drain your battery and you're gonna have a problem. So this wire here needs power that is switched only when you want that alternator running, which is when the ignition's on. I turn the ignition on. You can see the voltage is dropping. 
My ignition is live, we still have spark. We could start it if we wanted. But now, we're drawing juice from the battery, so we want to charge that. Let's spin her up. And now you can see the charging voltage. We are definitely charging. If you caught that, the electric motor sped up. The voltage regulator decided it had enough voltage and stopped charging at full capacity. So uh, that's how that whole system works. Now this Jeep has a one-wire alternator, which is the simplest ever. It has one connection, and that goes right to your battery. Now if you're wiring up something pretty basic for just yard use, like a forklift or something like that, you can turn it on, you can start it, you have ignition, you have charging. You have everything you need right here. We're done. But if you want fancy things like lights and stuff, we got to go a little bit further here. Now if you have a vehicle that's old enough that it's still using a carburetor and a standalone ignition and that kind of stuff, it probably has sealed beam headlights. So I'm just going to talk about those. But basically what you have is three terminals, and the one over here is a ground. The one down low, you put power to that, you get low beam. And the one on the right, you put power to that, you get high beam. If you have the 3 8 wide big spade connectors, you can wire it up with those. That works fine. But you can also buy standard replacement headlight plugs that do all three in one shot. And that makes life a little bit easier. They're not too expensive. Now we can hook up these wires to make our light go. Most systems use two of these, but they're wired exactly identical. So you basically connect the wires from one the same way to the other one. So I'm just going to hook up one to make life a little easier on my table here. Now the easiest way to wire up a headlight with both beams is a double throw switch. Off of the center, on on one side, and then on on the other side. What this does is it basically takes the center connector and connects it to either one side or the other. So then depending on where I turn my switch, you can go from low, off in the middle, high. If you mount this in the dashboard, generally I put the high beam up and the low beam down. You are totally set. You've got your on and off and your high and low all in one switch. You're done. Now my truck uses a floor mounted dimmer switch like this one. This is a standard Motor Products DS52. And uh, I guess dimmer switch number 52, something like that. This one is the same one I use on the Jeeps. Now this one actually mounts in the floor on that plate and just this button part sticks up, all the wires are hidden below. They make other versions where you can mount them flush on a floor and the wires up top here and you run those in the interior if it's hard to get to the back side. Doesn't matter, they all work the same way. Uh, basically you have one input for battery, and this one's actually labeled. And then it switches between two different outputs. One beam, another beam. And basically you keep switching this back and forth, but there's no off function here. So we're gonna have to do that separately. So now we need to talk about a completely unnecessary subject. Fuses. And I say they're unnecessary because you don't actually need these for anything. If everything goes well in your wiring, you will never need these. But it's probably a good idea to put them in. They have a little strip of metal that when the amperage gets too high, that heats up and burns out and disconnects your circuit. There's the inline ones, which are simple and easy. You just put them in the line you're going to and you're done. Now, if you start to do a lot of circuits and you use these, they get real messy real fast. They also have fuse boxes, which most cars come with standard. A simple little box like this is only a few dollars. I think I paid like four bucks or something for this. You saw me use one just like this when I wired up the half track. But I ran into a fortunate set of circumstances. A little while back, when I was doing my car trailer refresh, a company called Nylite gave me some lights to use in that build. And uh, after they saw the video, they were still talking to me and asked if I wanted more stuff. So I said yes. I had some issues with their lights, but the quality of the actual light itself was fine. It was just a little bit of the hardware and fit and finish that I didn't like. And judging by the comments I saw in that video, a lot of you guys have bought stuff from them and had good results too. That means a lot to me. Now that company makes a lot of electro products like fuse boxes. And these are real fancy ones. I think they're like 15 bucks. And what they are, the six gang fuse box, they even have little LEDs in them to indicate when a fuse is blown out. Hey, it works. So uh, it's definitely more expensive than the basic one. Not too bad. And uh, we'll see how it works. And not only to get the one fuse box, I got three of them. 
For a particular reason, my plan is to have a power always on fuse box and everything in this box is live all the time. A on fuse box, so only in the start and on positions are the things hooked to this box live. And then an accessory box for the accessory position, so only in the on and accessory positions is this one live. I think that'll make it a little easier to see how I'm hooking it all up and also easier to diagnose when I have an issue. Now you do not need to go with three. Even on a little box like this, you can put power wherever you want to whatever you want. You can take this box and have two fuses live all the time, three that are in on position, one an accessory, or whatever you want. You could do the same concept with a single box, no problem. There, they should stay now. And my goal is to get my measurements close enough, I can pre-cut the wires for this test rig and they'll fit directly in here when I'm done. Hopefully that'll work. Now I've got to cut multiple wires the same length. So I just measure a distance here that I can just roll and line up and cut. I don't need to measure it every time. There's a main positive and negative hookup. And then all the fused areas are positive. You have a strip of connectors for negative. And each one I hooked up one of these little LED lights because it was real convenient. And now we can see what's on where. For the battery, go to this fuse box, which is always going to be on when the battery's on. So let's hook up the battery. Well, that one's on. Now from the battery, I have power going to the ignition switch. So I can turn the switch on. We have both on an accessory. Or I can turn it to just accessory. We have only that box. Or I can turn it to start. and accessory goes out. So it's the same thing we read before when we were looking at the test light. So now it's all sitting here easy to get to. The reason that I've started working with the fuse boxes right after we installed the headlights is because you're gonna have to start making some decisions now. Now the other stuff we hooked up was real obvious. Uh, obviously the addition, you hook to the ignition power, starter to starter power, there's no choices. With headlights, there's options. Now so far I've only wired in the high low beam switch. So I hooked up power to the on section. That way, when I turn the ignition on, we have lights all the time. When we turn the ignition off, we have no lights. So this will work like those daytime running lights. It's a perfectly viable solution. You may have noticed most vehicles, you get in, you can turn the headlights on even with the ignition off, which means they're hooked to the battery only power that's on all the time. And that's how people can leave their headlights on after they park and run their battery dead. So you could do that, but you don't have to. Now I'm thinking I want to run it off the accessory power. That way when I turn it off, the headlights go off for sure. If I want the headlights on even without the engine running, I can turn it to accessory and still have that. But now we have to run through a switch. You can run through an on-off switch, that would work fine. Now for this truck, I'm going to run through a two-position switch, much like a factory one. And this is my headlight switch here. That's right here is power in. This right here is when you pull out one position, it turns that on, so that'll be running lights. Now right now I have this terminal hooked to the rear tail lights. That can go to all your marker lights. Front markers, side, rear, everything can connect to that one, so they all go on at the same time. And this one right here, you pull out two positions and that turns on, and this one stays on. So we have power in, running lights, headlights. This one grounds when you have it all the way closed. I don't know why, but I'm not gonna use it. We pull out once. We've got our running lights. We pull out again. We have our running lights and our headlights. And this also works when you have it in the on position. And so we have all our lights then. But then you go and turn off your car, your headlights turn off automatically, even if you left the headlight switch on. So that's not standard practice, but that's how I'm gonna wire this one. If you want them on all the time, but still have a switch, you just move your connector over to the on. Now, no matter where my ignition switch is, even in the off position, you have t your running lights and your headlights just like a regular vehicle. Because it's all up to you what you want to do. Here, right, since we have headlights and tail lights, we're going to need brake lights next. Right here, I have a brake light switch. Now this is a pedal switch, which is one that's operated off the physical brake pedal. So you move that brake pedal, it operates those lights. They also have pressure switches, which go somewhere in your hydraulic system of your brakes and just sense the pressure. They do the same thing. And that's the style this truck has, just a pressure switch on the master cylinder. And you can hook these to whatever you want. On the International I just worked on, the brake lights went on all the time, 
even with the switch off. So that was hooked to straight battery power. Maybe you only want brake lights when you're on. So you can have accessory and no brake lights, but on and you do have brake lights. It's your car, you can do whatever you feel like. Well, probably except just completely disconnect the brake lights and uh, not have them work at all. Some people would probably frown on that, particularly the ones with flashing lights behind your car. They'd frown on that. And the people that were around you. So you probably don't actually want that at all. Yeah, I think brake lights are one of the most important things you got going. Now Nylite hooked me up with these taillights too. They're an LED replacement for a Jeep taillight. And they have not only the high and low for the tail and stop lights, they also have built-in license plate lights. Now normally, a pair of lights like this, you'd only have a license plate light on one of them. This one, both of them have it. I'm not 100% sure why, because I only have one license plate. They also have an integrated backup light. And I find backup lights really handy, especially at night, and particularly when I'm backing up. It seems to make things better. Now most modern transmissions have a switch already in the transmission for this. And it's basically an on-off switch. So you hook your backup lights to one side, you hook power to the other side, there you go. You hit reverse, you got backup lights. I didn't see one in this transmission. I'm not 100% sure because there's still a lot of grease built up in the transmission, but I haven't found one yet. But it's from the early 40s, so it might not even have one at all. So I'm just going to hook a regular toggle switch so I can just turn on the backup lights whenever I want. If I go to back up, it's not going to automatically turn on, I'll have to press a button, but yeah, that's not a big deal. And the advantage to that is if I hook it up to the accessory position, I can flip these lights on whenever I want with a switch. I don't have to be in reverse. So I could eliminate stuff behind me when I'm loading or something like that. It's time to think about turn signal lights. Now the easiest way to add them is just a simple double throw switch. We have the left and right turn signal lights hooked up to either side. One thing to note about these switches is they're on a pivot. So when you switch it this way, the other side goes that way. So when your switch moves this way, that one turns on. When your switch moves that way, this one turns on. So just keep in mind that's an opposite in case you want the left to go to the left and the right to go to the right. Now I'm hooking up power to my on position. So I figure I only need signal lights when the vehicle is on. So this switch controls each one. Move it to one side, move it to the other side, and I can even blink it. This would actually work as a turn signal. But it's not fun to have to keep sitting there and blinking it back and forth. So we have to add a flasher into the mix. And that got a lot more complicated than I expected. This is the old standard 552 that's been used for decades. And there are two prongs on it. You hook the battery to one, you hook your lights to the other, and it blinks. Now I know for sure this won't work. I took one apart so you could see how it works. Now basically what you have here, you have two prongs and there's a little bit of a coil there and a thin piece of metal and some contact points. What happens is it starts off connected, electricity goes through that piece of metal, it heats up, it actually pulls this away and opens up those contact points and that disconnects it. So it's on, gets hot, disconnects, cools down, reconnects, turns on, gets hot, so forth. And it just blinks back and forth like that. Because it's heating up an element, you need a certain amount of electricity going through it to get it hot enough to pull this metal away. These do not work with LED bulbs. These LED bulbs draw so little juice, they don't heat up that little element. So what you have, let me hook one up. You have an X, which is where your power comes from, an L, which is your load or your lights. And I got my test rig set up on accessory power, so I'll turn that on. We're going to my same old double throw switch. And you turn it on, and it just sits there. The electricity is going through that little wire, trying to heat it up, but there's not enough. It never it gets hot enough to open those points up. So, these don't blink. And I knew that was going to be a problem from the start, but I had this lying around, so here I'll show you how it works. Now, we'll go up to the next step. This I bought specifically for this project. This is an EP50. It's the same two prong style, same connections, but this one is LED compatible. Rather than mechanical flasher, they refer to this as an electronic flasher. They say it's LED compatible. They also say it is good for between one to 20 bulbs. So I figured this would handle anything I had. So I bought it. It doesn't work either. Go to our same test rig, same hookups, and now does the same thing. Slightly different. Notice it gets bright and then gets dimmer as though it's trying to flash, but can't quite do it. So I was sort of disappointed that didn't work. 
but I have another option. This right here is a solid state flasher for a motorcycle. I actually pulled this directly out of that Honda Sandstar I built. Figured I'd give it a shot. Now this hooks up exactly the same way, same prongs, but I will warn you about one thing, is these are meant for a motorcycle where you're out in the air and you don't have a self-canceling turn signal, you never hear an actual flasher. So they put a buzzer in this one. It does blink. Now I have front turn signals hooked up. Now here we have my setup for the turn signals. There's two wires to each terminal because front and rear, front and rear, and that's the power in. So let's try this. Does the annoying buzzing, but they're blinking nicely. All right, now I'm gonna see if I can get rid of that buzzer. So now I'm gonna to go to my fancy new one and see if that works with two lights. Yep. These lights over here are side marker lights from a trailer. That's an incandescent bulb, not an LED. If I wanted to use LEDs on the front, would that work? So let's hook those up. And we're back to just on again. They don't draw enough juice to make it flash. It's bugging me that I can't get this to work right when they're saying they're LED compatible. So I went and bought an off the shelf one. This is an EP34 that says it's LED compatible. Now this is a smaller one for between two and six lamps, but I figured it's smaller than this one. Maybe it'll handle the lower power because physical size has a lot to do with the electrical carrying capacity or something like that. Anyway, the only one they had was a three wire hookup. So this hooks up the same. We have the power in, we have the load out, but there's also an E terminal, which we hook to our ground right there. So it's one more wire with the ground, but figured I gotta get this working. I'm gonna give it a shot. Got our signal here, and this flasher works fine. So now I've got a setup that works with what I want. I've got my LED rear light, I've got my LED front light. It's blinking properly, and I just have to run one extra wire. Now I don't have a real good conclusion here. One thing that occurs to me is this flasher that does work with the three prongs, with the extra ground, maybe that somehow makes the voltage more stable. Uh, not really sure if that's true. There's probably other two prong ones that work better. If you do happen to know one that works, please leave a comment. If you can, leave a part number. That way, if anyone is looking for that information, they can have that. But I know for sure this one does. So we're gonna move forward with this. Because the next thing we have to deal with is having both brake lights and turn signals on the same light bulb. Now this is our previous setup for the brake lights. This is a standard brake light switch like pretty much every vehicle. And you have one power in and then there is one power out. And in our case, we split it to the left and right light. So what happens when you hook up this switch to the lights? So now this is wired exactly the same as the last time I did brake lights, this switch powering the brake lights. But I don't know if you noticed, our front turn signal's also wet because we now have that turn signal switch installed connecting all that. What happens when we do turn signals? The wires back feed through the brake light switch and we now have hazard lights, no matter which way you try to turn. So this won't work. Now, there's a way to get around this. Now these boxes right here are diodes. They're commonly used on trailers. And what they do, I don't know if you can read it there, it has two inputs and one output. So you can take the two separate inputs, the one from the brakes and the one from the turn signal. In this case, I took those wires that were going right to the rear lights and I snipped it, plugged one in there, the other one in there. Then I took the wires coming out of my brake light switch and I plugged that into the other connector. So what this does is it only will let electricity go to the light, it won't let it go backwards into the switch or through the switch to the other light. So let me show you how these work. Now we have our signal lights. Both are working properly. Our brake lights. They work properly and they don't turn on the front signal lights. So now we have a complete system with working brake lights and working turn signals all on the same bulbs. Now there is one thing you'll notice on these 
And it's up to you whether you consider it a drawback. I don't necessarily consider it a problem. If you are signaling, and then you hit the brakes, the brake lights take over. Now personally, the most important thing I want taillights to do is to keep people from rear-ending me. So for me, people knowing I'm stopping is the priority. Uh, in most OEM systems though, they don't do it this way. They usually have the signal light cancel out the brake light. For your absolute safest option, probably your best bet is to run separate turn signal lights and don't try to run them through the same bulb. And that's real easy. Basically, you do the exact same wiring we did the first time without the diodes or anything, but you just run brake lights to one light, signal lights to another light, and they never mix, you have no problems. But that means you have to add separate lights. If you're building a vehicle from scratch, that might be fine. A lot of vehicles have only two tail lights and you're stuck with that system. But of course, there's a solution to that too. The aftermarket seven wire turn signal switch. They actually make these switches in a number of different variations. Uh, the seven wire is one I want to use here. I have used a four wire one previously because I had it lying around on that little red Jeep project. But that works exactly the same as this switch with the only the four wires, they basically have a left or right. They don't have separate front or rear signals. And so you have to use the same kind of diode system or something like that, or extra bulbs. The seven wire switch takes care of it because they have different outputs for front and rear, and they incorporate a brake light input. And basically what they do is when you turn it to a signal, they disconnect the brake light and turn it to that signal light. So that takes care of it in one unit. So let's hook this thing up. I bought this, it was pretty cheap, it came with absolutely no instructions. So I went and looked online to try to find instructions for these. I found a lot of different options. Some of these don't have the colors I have. So we're gonna get rid of those right away. This one, same thing. Now both these diagrams have the colors I have on my switch, but they're not the same either. But really there's only one difference. The blue wire either goes to your flasher or it goes to ground. I don't know which one I actually have, we're gonna try them both and see what it does. Now here's our exhaust pipe. We're gonna pretend that's a steering column. And these just attach with a hose clamp. It's real easy. Now since you're making this vehicle anything you want, you could point it out the left side like usual. You could point it out the right side. You could point it straight up. It really doesn't matter. Now these are supposed to be grounded, so you might need to scrape a little paint off your steering column or run a separate ground wire. You can just clamp the uh, copper underneath it. So now I have everything hooked up except that one blue wire that we don't know where it goes. So we're gonna try brake lights. Got brake lights. We're gonna try signal lights. We got signaling going. Other direction signaling. Now we'll hit the brakes and signal. And as you can see, this one disconnects the brake light from that side and adds a signal. Let's try the hazards. Yep, we got hazard lights. These indicator lights aren't lighting up at all. So let's try grounding it. Now this is a case where you're glad you have fuses, because if we blow a fuse, it's okay. I've grounded it and absolutely nothing happens. All right, let's try putting it to power. We got blinking. So what this wire is, this wire is for the indicator light that makes it not stop blinking. So I have that hooked up to power, it just continually blinks, no matter what, even when the signal lights are off. So I've concluded that both wiring diagrams are wrong. Now one option I have here is just completely ignore the blue wire. It works fine, I can signal. I don't actually need the indicator for anything, so I could get by with this but it kind of bothers me that it doesn't work. So I'm gonna play with it a little more and see what I can do. I took it apart, I had to know for sure. This blue wire definitely is just an indicator bulb. Now what we have is we have a pattern of copper pads and this piece goes on there and as you turn the lever, it slides across them. We have power in here, that is signal power. That's the exact same circuit, just in a different spot. All right, holding down the brake light switch, that one is your brake light connector. Basically, when you have the switch in the middle position, it connects that brake light connector to both the rear tail lights. And then when you turn it, it slides one of these pads off one of the um, terminals for a rear light and then connects the signal side 
to a front one and one rear one. Now it looks like that inner circle only deals with the signal light part and the outer circle has the brake lights on it. So I'm wondering if I take my blue wire and attach it to that inner circle there, will I have an indicator that works when I want it to? Let's find out. Hopefully this works because it's going to be kind of permanent. And there's a completed modification. The blue wire goes into that inner ring and we're all back together. Now we just got to put the cover on and be all set. Okay, moment of truth here. Do we have an indicator? We do. Then it turns off. Then it turns back on. Now I recently hooked one like this up on that little red keep. If you saw it in the Christmas special. And that went no problem at all. It worked perfectly. So I really wasn't expecting these problems. But that Jeep has incandescent lights, not LED ones. And that Jeep had the old style mechanical three prong flasher in it already. That's what I used and everything worked fine. That one also came with instructions too. And I don't know if the problem is because this was the cheapest one I could find. I think it was like 12 bucks or something like that. Or maybe the problem is this style turn signal is meant for the older style incandescent lights. I really don't know. Well, as usual, I'm making this up as I go along and just showing you what I find. If you do know more about this, please leave a comment and uh, that way I learn and everyone else does too. It's always good to learn new stuff. So at this point, we have absolutely everything we need. We have running lights. We have headlights. We have brake lights. We have turn signals. We basically have everything we need for the basics. Now we can go on to more accessories. For the truck I'm working on now, it's real basic. It's a manual choke. It doesn't have much electronic anything in it. Um, if you do have an electric choke, you probably want to put that on the on circuit. That way you don't have your electric choke running while your engine is off or, you know, on accessory. Electric fans. Now, electric fans are usually hooked up with an on off switch that goes to temperature. So you can hook that up to the battery only circuit and that way it's on all the time. You shut your engine off, it runs the fan until it cools down. That's an option. But if for some reason the engine's hot and you're working on it, even if it's off, the fan could go on. If you put it in the on circuit, you'd only have the fan work when your engine's running, which is probably fine. Then you probably don't even need the thermostat. You can just have it work whenever the engine's running. Or you could have the accessory position. So if you want to cool down the engine after you shut it off, you turn it to accessory. It cools down the engine till the thermostat kicks it off. You turn it to off, everything's done. You don't have to worry about turning on automatically. There's a lot of things you can do here. Since I brought up electric fans, we got to talk about electric fans. Now the key thing you need to know about for wiring is electric fan draws a lot of electricity. So you're going to need real thick wires and a real strong switch in order to operate it. And this is the same with any high draw accessory that's going to draw, oh, let's say 30 amps or more. Uh, that's generally when you want to uh, go to the relay system. The basic premise of a relay is you don't really want that thick wire and high power going through your interior. But you want the switch that operates it in your interior. What you do when you add the relay, you have the switch with a low power that sends a signal to the relay and the relay relays the signal at a higher power to the device you need. So basically it's a switch operating a switch. You've probably seen them before. They're a little cube. I took one apart so you can look inside. What we have inside here is electromagnet on one side and the actual switch goodies over here. All that is is a contact that moves from one side to the other. Now this one has the diagram written right on the side. There's going to be five terminals on a standard relay. You're only going to use four of them. Those two numbers correspond to that electromagnet. This one is your power supply and the 87 and 87A is where it goes back and forth. 87A, it's touching normally. When you put power to it, it disconnects. 87 is not touching normally. When you put power to it, it connects. Now right now, I only have the two small connectors, 85 and 86 hooked up. They're the ones that operate the electromagnet. And I have power going into it in this one down here, the number 30. Now up here, there's two terminals that face the opposite direction. Those are 87 on the side and 87A, the one in the middle. And that's where you're gonna hook up your load. But before we hook up a load, I'm gonna show you how this works. Another thing to note, these are the two terminals that go to the solenoid. 
One's a positive, one's a negative. It doesn't matter which way you hook it up. You can hook it up either way. They don't care. There's our contacts. I'm gonna take my two wires. For now, I'm gonna make this one negative and this one positive. You can see, that works fine. I'm gonna switch them around. Still works exactly the same. Here's the wire for my electric fan. We're gonna to go to the 87 terminal, which is the one on the outside. And now we trigger it. Our fan is up and running. But now we're gonna to go to the 87A terminal. Now when you're hooked to this terminal, it's normally on. You need to hook up the relay in order to turn it off. So we trigger the relay, and now the fan turns off completely. Now if we disconnect the little electromagnetic wires, the fan goes back on. That's why you only use four out of the five terminals. You pick which one you want, the 87 or 87A, as to whether you want it to normally be on or normally be off. So you can wire these things up however you want. Now I'm triggering these wires just with sticking them on the fuse box. You can do it with a switch and just have it on and off. You can also put it on a thermostatic control. They make a lot of different aftermarket ones. Those are real nice. If you buy one of those, they show you how to wire into the system. And oftentimes they'll include a relay with it. It depends on how you want to build your vehicle. There's a lot of different ways out there to do it. Now wiring is a complicated subject and you could go on for a long time with more details. But I want to give you a basic overview of what you need. And also, I got my system ready for my truck. I can go ahead, turn it on, start it, uh, drive it. I've got spark, I've got brake lights, I've got headlights, I've got high and low beam, running lights, I've got signal lights with the properly working indicator. I've got a fan if I want it on a relay. And I have plenty of room in my fuse boxes to add anything else I come up with, like work lights and fog lights and things like that. This is a whole basic concept of working with an awful lot of projects out there, and you can apply this to pretty much anything you're working on. I had a lot of fun here experimenting with electricity, and I learned a number of things too. Actually, a little more than I wanted to know about signal lights and flashers, but it's good to have, and now the system's set up. And I hope it helped you guys out a little bit along the way too. So, that's it for now. We'll see you next time. Now you may have noticed, I started the video with this starter, but I didn't use it in the video. That's because it didn't work. This is one I got with that pile of stove bolt Chevy parts, and when I hooked it up, it didn't work. I went to another starter immediately. Then I found a bad connection on the battery. So we're gonna rehook this one up and see if it actually works. It works. It's just a bad connection on the negative that really caused the problem. At least I got another working starter here.